exactly two years ago today, Jamaica confirmed its first case of COVID-19. One year ago today, the first shipment of vaccines arrived in Jamaica. That also marks the advent of the country's vaccination program. 22% of the population has been fully vaccinated to date, leaving an alarming 78% of the population unvaccinated. Good evening. I'm Dominique Graham, a research assistant here at the Caribbean Policy Research Institute, CAPRI. CAPRI is an independent public policy think tank based at the UIMONA. Our mission is to conduct evidence-based research towards improved public policy making in Jamaica and the Caribbean. We endeavor to address issues that are relevant to economic and social development. This evening, we tackle one that is timely and important with the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome to the launch of the report, Long Shot, aiming to reduce vaccine hesitancy. This report explores the reasons behind the low uptake of COVID vaccines in Jamaica and gives recommendations to increasing demand based on findings from a survey. This report was supported by Blue Dot Insights. Capri's Chief People's Officer, Christina Ivey, will do a presentation on the findings of this report. A panel discussion will follow, moderated by our Director of Research, Dr. Diana Thorburn, with the Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness, Dr. Christopher Tufton, and PAHO representative to Jamaica, Bermuda, and the Cayman Islands, Mr. Ian Stein. We invite our audience to participate in our discussion by using the online platform Slido. Simply browse to slido.com and enter the event code CAPRI. There, you may post your questions and vote on the polls. We now welcome Mrs. Janae Stevens-Taylor, Head of Research at Blue Dot Insights, to bring remarks. Dr. the Honorable Christopher Tufton, Minister of Health and Wellness, Mr. Ian Stein, Pan American Health Organization and World Health Organization representative to Jamaica, Bermuda, and the Cayman Islands, Dr. Diana Thorburn, Director of Research, Capri, and our viewers online on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Good evening. Blue Dot is pleased to have been the data collection engine behind Capri's latest effort at encouraging policy stirring thought. At Blue Dot, we are champions of data-driven decision-making, particularly where those decisions have national implications. And as such, we embraced the opportunity to ensure that policies or strategies aimed at encouraging vaccination among Jamaicans are driven by data on Jamaicans. Jamaica continues to trail our Caribbean neighbors in the rate of vaccination against COVID-19, despite the internationally proven safety and efficacy of the available jabs. We applaud Capri for going beyond acknowledging this fact and instead air that sought to understand the segments of the Jamaican population that were especially resistant to taking the COVID-19 vaccines and understanding the factors driving the resistance. Using random stratification sampling techniques, Blue Dot ensured a demographically representative sample of adult Jamaicans based on key variables, including age, gender, and parish of residence. Data collection featured Blue Dot's digital survey platform and one-click deployment of surveys to numerous tablet devices for interviewer use. The platform also allows for fanatic quality control with tracking and recording functionality and eliminates the need for manual data entry. Our ultimate goal at Blue Dot was to efficiently and accurately collect data to inform Capri's sophisticated analysis and ensure conclusions drawn were derived from sound data. We look forward to the public sharing of Capri's findings and the strategies or policies that they will inform. Thank you. Thank you, Janice, and it truly is a pleasure working with Blue Dot. We're going to have the presentation now presented by our Chief People Officer, Christina Ivey. Jamaica has the second lowest vaccination rate in the Caribbean with only 22% of its population being fully vaccinated since beginning in March last year. This is despite an adequate supply of vaccines. Two years into this pandemic, the country will almost definitely miss its target of vaccinating 65% of the population by March 31st, 2022. Until this study, it was unclear why vaccine uptake was so low. As such, 
we sought to determine the underlying factors that contribute to low vaccine uptake in Jamaica, as well as the psychographic and demographic profile of the vaccine hesitant. We did this using a survey of a cross-sectional sample of 1,170 participants across the country. Vaccination against COVID-19 or any communicable disease is a public health good. We have clear evidence that vaccinations reduce the mortality and morbidity of the COVID-19 virus. This benefits not only people who contract COVID-19, but also those who would otherwise be displaced from a hospital bed or whose treatment would be deemed less important. Our public health system, which bears the cost of treating people COVID positive, also benefits from increased vaccination uptake. Increased vaccination uptake means our national economy will suffer less from the productivity losses incurred by people's inability to work. Jamaica's economic recovery has been hampered by the continuation of the pandemic and the me measures necessary to control it. This being the case, the government has a clear mandate to procure vaccines and make every effort to promote their uptake in its duty to provide public health goods to the population. Across the world, experience suggests that the factors influencing vaccine uptake are complex and dynamic. There is no single factor which provides an adequate determination of people's willingness to be vaccinated. Our survey results gave us a picture of the typical vaccine hesitant Jamaican. This person is young, low income, did not finish primary school, is not religious, is not complacent, but is risk averse and does not trust the government or the vaccine. We can further break down the profile of the vaccine hesitant. The survey uncovered that 18 to 24 year olds were the most likely to be unvaccinated with nearly 70% of them having not taken the vaccine. This may not be due to any intrinsic difference in age categories, but to their sources of information. Younger people are more likely than older people to get their information from social media, where conspiracy theories and anti-vaccination propaganda thrive. We also found gender was not an important determinant of vaccine hesitancy in Jamaica, unlike many other countries. Education was, however, a critical determinant of willingness to be vaccinated. 46% of persons with a bachelor's degree were vaccinated, compared to only 33% of those who did not finish high school, and 23% of those who did not finish primary school. In the same vein, half the high income bracket had taken the vaccine, compared to just 35% of the lower income bracket. This is likely because less educated people on lower incomes may not have access to high quality information related to the vaccine and may be less able to understand the information they do have or be subject to misinformation, which is often more digestible. Complacent individuals believe their risk of contracting COVID-19 is low and that if they contract the virus, they are unlikely to have severe illness. More complacent individuals were eight percentage points less likely to take the vaccine than those not complacent. Complacency is also strongly correlated with socioeconomic status, where higher complacency is correlated with lower socioeconomic status, and both are correlated with lower likelihood of taking the vaccine. We know this complacency, some of it, is being fed by misinformation. A person's risk appetite was a significant factor in whether they will take the vaccine. 84% of risk averse individuals avoided the vaccine compared to only 34% of those who are not risk averse. A large proportion of respondents indicated an interest in more information about the vaccines and say they would be persuaded to get jabbed if they had more information about their safety in particular. Surprisingly, we found that 47% of religious persons had taken the vaccine which is 12 percentage points more than non-religious respondents. Convenience was cited as an overwhelming factor in vaccine uptake, where 95% of respondents 
described some aspect of the vaccination process delivery as inconvenient. While this does not necessarily mean that inconvenience was the binding obstacle to vaccination, since only 4% stated that a more convenient location would make it more likely for them to take the vaccine, the high proportion is still noteworthy. These people could be unvaccinated primarily because of other factors, but the discovery that so many deem it to be inconvenient suggests that the government's efforts are still lacking. A doctor's office is the preferred location to receive the vaccine, followed by a health center. Community centers and schools are the least favored sites to get vaccinated. If even one in every 10 unvaccinated persons overcomes their reluctance because getting vaccinated becomes more convenient, the country's vaccination rate would rise by eight percentage points. Com confidence in the vaccine is low. Nearly 80% of those who did not take it indicated that they lacked trust in their government compared to 36% of people who do trust the government. This historical distrust cannot be in undone in a time frame that would have any bearing on the trajectory of the pandemic, but it should be considered with regard to who is disseminating the pro-vaccination messages. Additionally, there is even higher distrust in the vaccines themselves. 87% of the unvaccinated do not trust the vaccine, compared to 35% of the vaccinated. They cite concerns about the newness of the vaccines, their potential harms, or not knowing enough about the vaccines as reasons for not getting vaccinated. But there is hope, 78% said, that more information about how the vaccine works, its effectiveness, and its safety would most likely persuade them to take it. The typical vaccine-hesitant Jamaican would like more information regarding the safety of the vaccine. They are most likely to be convinced by a family member, doctor, or other healthcare worker to take it, and convenience for them means going to a doctor's office or a health center to get jabbed. We have just four recommendations which follow directly from our survey's findings. Firstly, easy to understand messaging and information packages should be created that specifically speak to the safety of the vaccines, their ingredients, how they work, and how they were developed so far. They should have content to counteract existing and widespread misinformation and disinformation about COVID-19 and the vaccines. This content should continue to use the culturally relevant language as some vaccination campaigns already have done to ensure that info is well received and understood by those who need it most. The method of delivery should also be informed by the characteristics of the target audience. Secondly, the role of doctors and healthcare professionals should be emphasized in delivering messages aimed at increasing vaccine take up. Vaccinated persons should also be encouraged to talk to their family members and persuade them to take the vaccine. Public officials should not be the face of campaigns to increase vaccination, nor the carriers of pro-vaccination messages, given the widespread distrust of the government. Instead, doctors and nurses should be the primary messengers of information related to the COVID-19 vaccine. The majority of respondents cited family members as the person most likely to be able to convince them to take the vaccine. Social media influencers, admired entertainers, and the like might also be enrolled in such efforts. Next, the process of getting vaccinated should be made more convenient and be seen to be more convenient. Doctors' offices and health centers are people's preferred locations to receive the vaccine. While there have been initiatives to increase the distribution of the vaccine via private doctors, this should be continued and expanded. These efforts should be well publicized and the ease of getting vaccinated broadcast widely. And finally, a compensation scheme should be developed for vaccine-related health complications. The government had to indemnify vaccine manufacturers in order to obtain COVID-19 vaccines. 
Now they are liable if an individual develops a side effect after taking the COVID-19 vaccine. Injured persons would have to bring a claim against the government in court to receive compensation, but there are usually significant delays in seeking redress through the courts. This being the case, the government should develop a compensation scheme for vaccine-related complications to provide reassurance to those who are concerned about, vaccin about vaccination side effects and are risk averse. The government should buy this insurance for this risk from a third party. Jamaica's hospitalization data shows that the unvaccinated account for 87% of those hospitalized and 98% of those who have died from COVID-19 re related complications. Mass vaccination is the country's best option out of the pandemic. Attaining herd immunity would allow us to curtail the spread of the virus, meaning fewer deaths and lower morbidity, and allowing people to restore and maintain their livelihoods. Going forward, trust, information, and convenience are the three areas that should inform efforts to increase vaccine uptake in Jamaica. Thank you, Christina. We are, before we go into our panel discussion with the minister and Mr. Stein, we're inviting everyone in the audience to go to slido.com and not only ask questions, but also answer our polls. There's a first poll there. We'll share the results at the end. And when you've answered that poll, there'll be a second poll that you don't have to answer right now, but do answer it before the end of the presentation, before the end of the panel discussion. Um, I think it will give some insight into how well we've actually managed to convey the message here. And I'll ask the same question to both of you as well when I get the chance. Um, before we start taking questions, whether from me or from the audience, I'm going to invite each of you to give a two minute response, just an initial response, you'll have a chance to say more later, to the study and the study's findings. I'm gonna start with you, Mr. Stein. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me this evening. It's a tremendous opportunity to join you, People Capri, your team, and Minister Tufton to have this important conversation. Very much appreciate the opportunity. So I think that what we find here is very aligned to the Pan American Health Organization's mission as well, an evidence-based approach towards finding the right path forward. PAHO, the Regional Office for the World Health Organization in the Americas, is the permanent ally, the evidence-based organization that works with the Ministry of Health here in Jamaica and throughout all the countries, the Americas. And so this permanent relationship is an important dynamic that is uh, a part of this response. Mm -hmm. We're particularly interested in this study, and we're particularly interested because we know, as your colleagues had mentioned, the fact that vaccination together with social measures, we know are the proven paths forward to get us back to a sense of normalcy. And so as an organization, we are always looking to ensure that we are following the evidence based to find the right way to overcome the driving issues that are driving the reluctance in the population. So this study that Capri has done, very welcome, as we see that there are many studies that are underway. Uh, and I think that all of them are gonna tell um, a little bit more of the story that we need to better understand. While this study has done a very good job to portray a typical reluctant person here in Jamaica, I think we would also anticipate that there might be some uh, lack of heterogeneity on some of these things. Mm -hmm. I think that this has done a very good step forward, but I think there's also additional information because I think it's reasonable to expect that a, uh, an older person in their 70s might have different reasons and different reluctance than an unemployed person in their 20s. Mm -hmm. Uh, or a parent, as an example. Mm -hmm. So this is a phenomenal and a really important step forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Minister, a two-minute initial response. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much uh, to you and uh, Mr. Stein, PAHO, WHO rep here, and of course Capri, um, for me anyway, represents a very important institution and always doing good work. So I want to commend you and the team for focusing on this very important issue. Uh, you know, the, 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 the findings are quite interesting, and I'm one who believe in research, data-driven uh, analysis and decision-making. And as the policymaker for public health, I'll certainly review and ask my team to review these numbers. And we do take them seriously. Um, 
generally uh, the position clearly from our perspective is that vaccines are the most important response to COVID-19. The vaccines that have been administered certainly in Jamaica have gone through rigorous tests and trials by WHO experts and others. Um, and uh, it is unfortunate that the take-up rate, which now is probably uh, just over 660,000 Jamaicans who are fully vaccinated um, of the 2 million or so that we have targeted, is, is well below what we would like. Uh, you know, when you get into the further discussion around the numbers, uh, there are a couple of things that may require some exploration. One is that the perception around vaccination and the extent of hesitancy has to be dissected around a few critically important things, some of which you have mentioned here. Uh, the trust is a big issue. Uh, risk is a big issue. Uh, timing is a big issue, which may not have been mentioned in the study and the administration of the process, the ease of access, which was mentioned. Mm -hmm. I think the timing issue is important uh, and perhaps, you know, I would have certainly liked it to be more included in the process because the perception around the vaccination program in the early stages of COVID, when the vaccine at that time was not actually available, when the risk was perceived to be highest, people had significant fears but the vaccines were more concentrated into parts of the world, the developed world, uh, to my mind, created a missed opportunity for take up for us. Later on, as the risk became perceived as not as intense and the noise around vaccination and, and the anti-vaxxers, and even in the medical fraternity where there were mixed views, it created a trust issue, not just among the policymakers, but generally speaking. So while I fully appreciate and fully endorse the study and the findings, and I believe we should take it seriously, I think uh, there were some other issues which I'd like to bring into the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Thank you, uh, Minister. Just also want to remind viewers that not only can you pose questions, you can also vote up questions. So if you see a question that you think you want to hear answered, you can vote it up. And on my side, I will see it at the top of my list of questions. Uh, some of the questions that we are asked already kind of speak to some of the things that both Minister and Mr. Stein said in terms of the granularity of the study. It was a survey. Uh, we weren't able to get into issues of why schools were not favorable places or seen as convenient. But I think that... Um, idea that you know in the, in, in the at the outset most of the vaccine blitzes and drives were in community centers and schools and you know, we didn't have this data to know that people didn't know that schools were con inconvenient or not convenient for people to take the vaccine so i'd ask you mr stein and then i'll give you the opportunity to answer as well minister what is perhaps one or two things from the study that you say that if we had known that then we might have done differently. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, allow us to reflect on a particularly important issue around vaccination programs in general. When we do vaccination programs, while this particular time access has, to the vaccine itself has been difficult, historically, we see that the hardest part of vaccination programs are getting vaccines into arms. Mm -hmm. You, typically, you have the vaccine available, whether it's measles, uh, the, the range of different uh, routine vaccination. And the difficult things for many governments across the Americas has been to get vaccine into arms. Mm -hmm. And so uh, typically speaking, when we uh, look at these things, it is an issue of access, getting it to the point of access where people feel most comfortable. Mm -hmm. Certainly here in Jamaica, the challenge that was early on that Minister Tufton mentioned, and I agree that the timing is a very important issue, um, the small numbers of vaccine that were available during the early months of this mm -hmm. meant that the people that were going out to access the vaccines were gonna go wherever those were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're at a different stage in time mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. and it's really listening to this type of program, this type of research to say, where do people most favorably look to go to get their vaccine? Mm -hmm. So the research suggests mm -hmm. uh, that people want to go to doctor's offices. Mm -hmm. They want to go to health centers. Mm -hmm. 
those are places where vaccines are largely available through the programs that the ministry mm -hmm. has put forward. Mm -hmm. The public-private relationship and getting uh, medicine uh, vaccines to doctors has been a tremendous step forward. Health centers, obviously a routine place for this. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the challenges that we see now are, are challenges that um, are challenges that we often see in getting the vaccines into people's arms. Mm -hmm. Well, what would you say is one or, one or two things from the study that if you'd known that, then you might have done a little bit differently? <clears throat> well, I think that the, 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 the study is useful um, from the standpoint of the extent to which we create greater access points to have done that in the very early stages would have been a function of, as I said earlier, the availability of the vaccines. Because when we actually got the vaccines or started getting it, there were numbers were, quantities were small. And so what we actually did was to use those the best way we knew how, using the traditional methods and the traditional outlets for distribution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a very strong immunization program in, in, in the country. And that immunization program um, has been fairly successful. Our human development index, you know, life expectancy and so on is largely linked to that immunization program. Um, it comes with a protocol around how vaccinations are administered. Yes. It is the primary healthcare nurse. That protocol is almost culturally sacrosanct. It is, mm -hmm. it is holy territory, holy ground. And one of the things that I encountered certainly as minister, and I think the, pro the process encountered, not to take away from the people, the public health team that have been involved, they did a good job, is that there was a lot of hesitancy in releasing that protocol. Mm -hmm. So creating more space for non-traditional outlets to administer the vaccine. And it actually took some time to get there. And I mm -hmm. suspect that that contributed to some of the perceptions around convenience. Mm -hmm because there was a view that we needed to follow the protocol. Now, in a crisis, you have to adjust. Mm -hmm. And uh, in hindsight, mm -hmm. in, in relation to your question, I think maybe, well, not maybe, I think we probably should have pivoted earlier, mm -hmm. which would have addressed some of the concerns mm -hmm. around access. Well, I think that's um, correct. We did the survey in September, so by then we would have started to have the supply of vaccines. And the people who really wanted to it would have gotten it already. And now it was time to reach the people who weren't going to get it. I think another significant thing that we found, and you know, this is not unique to vaccinations, is but I was surprised by the extent to which it affected the vaccination process, which is the issue of the low trust in government and in the vaccine. And I we did a box pop that I think would be a nice way of introducing a discussion on this. If we can have the box pop on trust. No, I'm not vaccinated. Why aren't you? The reason I'm not vaccinated is because I don't know, I can't trust the system because I mean, I need to do more research on, on the whole vaccine thing right now. So I'm not sure. Right. So PAHO did a study before the vaccination program, which predicted a low take up, not as low as it actually was. It was 35% was the prediction and we're at 23. Uh, was trust factored in, did you recognize at the time that trust would be such a serious problem in the vaccine uptake? I think there's a risk here of trying to simplify things that are actually very complex. Mm -hmm. right? And so certainly trust is going to be a factor. Mm -hmm. And the trust in the vaccine, the trust in authorities is something that we're seeing across a broad range of countries, not just in, uh, as you've seen here in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So for us, the issue is we are looking at how there is this change in what we would call the social contract. Right? The part, your obligation as being a part of society is building in a, bar, a part towards the public health approach. Mm -hmm. And so that I think marries with this issue of trust. Because I think as we've seen over the past several years in many different places, in many different countries, that this issue of a belief in what has been a traditional approach 
the traditional uh, source of information mm -hmm. has changed with the new information age that we have it. Mm -hmm. So it was one of the pieces that was there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Minister, I know it must not be nice to hear that so many people don't trust the government. Uh, did, were you aware of how profound this feeling was and, and how that would translate over to the vaccination uptake, the low vaccination well, uptake? What, what I saw in this study, and it confirms my suspicion based on my experience, is that the trust issue was not just about government. It was also about yeah. the process. Mm -hmm. It was also about the vaccines. And that lack of trust, to my mind, was fed um, not just by the traditional low ratings of government. And the legitimacy of governments all over the world are under, mm -hmm. is under threat and is being challenged. Uh, and indeed, the, the, the polls leading up on other issues suggests at one point that the Ministry of Health had a stronger legitimacy in arguing the COVID response and the government itself, which 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 supports the view of the health workers, you know, the CMO and others who carry that messaging. But the, the reality is that the landscape in modern times have significantly adjusted around social media, which allows for a lot more voices to be heard. The anti-vax movement, to my mind, we in public health globally have been complacent, I think, about. And they have become well-resourced and a lot more forceful in their argument. And this create, provided an opportunity for them. And even in the medical field, trust was eroded because cre credentialed individuals, medical doctors, mm -hmm. were arguing the pros and cons of vac to vaccinate or not. So you're right. It's a very complex issue. In it, it, it's difficult to, to compare our own circumstances with other jurisdictions because context has a lot to do with it. I mean, in the developed world, the vaccines were available in the very early stages. In some countries, much more rigid laws were passed around vaccination as mandating it to access certain services. And we decided not to go that route. And that also had to be placed in the mix. So I agree with you and with the study that trust was a big issue. Um, the issue is in moving forward, how do you counter those elements or variables that go into creating that distrust? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that the mixed messages, to put it nicely, of medical professionals was probably particularly damaging given that the study said that the person or the source of information or the who was most likely to be able to convince them after a family member was a doctor or nurse. So that was particularly, uh, you know, a lot of dynamics going on in creating that lack of trust where the, the trust figures were the ones also speaking out uh, against the vaccine. At the 18 to 24 age cohort, the study has identified that as the most resistant. What is being done to, but, and you know, Mrs. Stein mentioned that you have to have different messages for different target audiences, but they're not only the ones who are least taking the vaccine, they're the ones who are moving around the most and who are likely to be the greatest transmitters. I think when the BPO had the, first mass outbreak, the concern there was these young people were going to be super spreaders. And so you had to take that very unusual move of quarantining these hundreds of young people um, in, a, in, state, in a state quarantine. What is being done now with regard to vaccination and that kind of problematic cohort? Right. <clears throat> so bear in mind, too, that the vaccination program started by targeting the more vulnerable age cohorts. So we started with the 60s and over and frontline workers early in the narrative when vaccines were seen as a true savior for them, having seen many deaths leading up to that point. And so the take up, the energy and enthusiasm around take up was greatest there. That did also have an impact on the take up rate of the younger cohort that cohort that you mentioned, in that they, I believe, bought into some of that narrative, whether rightly or wrongly so, that the real risk resided with the 60s and over, mm -hmm. their grandmothers and mothers, mm -hmm. not with them. And in a sense, we fed that narrative mm -hmm. because we have always said 
and it, it's it's a in, ref, in reflection we sh probably shouldn't have done that we have always said that you know it's not the young people when we started to make the connection between the spreaders the mm -hmm. super spreaders of the young spreading it to the parents mm -hmm. is when we we pivoted mm -hmm. with the messaging now we are and have seen in recent times, certainly with the 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 um the variant strain, not um not uh, the Omicron strain, but the Delta, where younger people are being affected more. And I think mm -hmm. it boils down therefore to risks and how we explain those risks, and not just the risks of COVID, but part of the narrative that has been developed out there is the risks of your, you know, capacity to produce you know your agility or mm -hmm. you know all of the things that go into creating a cultural dynamic mm -hmm. a belief system that could carry significant decision whether or not to get vaccinated so what we find ourselves doing in the communities now are one-on-one -on -one interaction mm -hmm. so we have expanded now into community-based activation using community leaders young leaders to be a part of the outreach mm -hmm. and hopefully that kind of interaction at that level rather than in the air will have a greater impact to address some of the concerns of that young cohort mm -hmm. well the study does say family members Fa family members are the key uh, source of um, ability to convince people to take the vaccine uh, would you consider something like some kind of a campaign or initiative or effort to not only have young people and peers pushing the message but getting family members who are vaccinated to convince maybe providing them with with helpful messaging is that something you would consider absolutely i mean if, if the study supports that and and we do believe in the, the data and the analysis of the data we will certainly we're certainly prepared to rethink the approach we do have young people currently in the uh, media advertising communication space promoting the value of the vaccines um, but you're right, to the extent that we may need to do that more, I have no difficulty mm -hmm. looking at that. Mm -hmm. I want to take it a little bit broader, Ian, with regard to the rest of the region. Jamaica is the second lowest in the hemisphere. From what you've gathered, I, you know, I would like to think we're one of the first to do a study like this. Maybe there's other data out there. Issues like the 18 to 24 group being the most resistant um, and doctors and family members being the most trusted sources to what extent are you able to see that is is jamaica unusual so we're unusual with regard to gender so we you know globally women are more resistant than men but in jamaica it was almost the same a statistically insignificant difference are you seeing any differences between jamaica and our specific cultural context that the minister referred to and what's obtaining whether elsewhere in the caribbean region or in the broader latin american and caribbean region Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is other research that has been done in the Caribbean. Uh, we were discussing this recently uh, amongst uh, colleagues within the Pan American Health Organization. And I think that one of the key issues that has emerged, and I'm hopeful that this is the same case here in Jamaica, although that's to be determined, is that there's actually research that suggests there's a large group of people that are still willing to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And I think for me that that actually is the most important issue that we have to better best determine. Um, so in terms of consistency, I think there's a lot of commonality where people go to, to uh, where to get information, who they trust. There's consistency in the Caribbean in that respect as well. Uh, I think that it's important to note that we often in this particular context, national context, we focus on the fact that Jamaica is the second lowest in the hemisphere. Mm -hmm. However, the reality is the fact that the, the of the lowest 10, the vast majority is in the Caribbean. Mm. And so there is commonality that is important to talk about in the Caribbean context. Mm -hmm. Certainly what takes place in Jamaica, the local context is the most important piece. Mm -hmm. And so that's why this study is particularly important as we dissect this and compare it to other places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And another piece that I think I would just like to pick up on is that um, it's important for us to continue to learn, right? We have seen this type of study, important place to guide us in our interventions. It has, uh, it has these studies and others before them have allowed us to say, where do we need to make change to address the challenges that we have?
I think learning is a healthy thing. We often think of the challenges. I remember my mother saying, this is going to be a learning experience. And I'm thinking like I could do with less learning experiences, <laughs> but these are important for us to, to pivot as the minister has said, mm -hmm. and these are all good things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to bring up the issue of mandates, vaccine mandates. It's not something that we directly addressed in the study, but we inferred uh, from the findings what the implications might be for a vaccine mandate. And before I ask, so I'll give you a minute to think about it while we play a box pop, which speaks to uh, what happens when people feel pressured or uh, impelled, compelled by somebody else to take the vaccine. If we could have that box pop. Are you vaccinated? Yes, I'm vaccinated. Johnson, Johnson. Johnson, Johnson. Johnson. Okay, what were your side effects? Well, my side effects would give me a little pain and a little fever, you know. And I take some Panadol to um, recover from that. Is there a specific reason as to why you took the vaccine in the first place? Well, what did you say? Apparently, work system, work system, and what the government did say. The type of work that I do, I'm really required to do. So, it's not really forced, they're forced, it's a great deal. It's the way of the system, you understand? So, I guess they are saying that it's a better way to do that by taking the vaccine. So, I really go ahead and do it. Yeah, so he took it, but the system made him do it. What's the view right now in specific contexts like Jamaica, the Caribbean, on mandates from PAHO and WHO? So it's an important uh, question around mandates uh, and important to understand the role of the World Health Organization and the Pan American Health Organization. With regard to mandates, of course, we see the effect of them, the outcome of how it changes of behavior and vaccination uptake. However, the role of the organization is to make recommendations to governments and governments to decide what is the most appropriate thing in the local context. Mm -hmm. Up to today, the WHO and PAHO have both been consistent in saying that these types of things, that the decision on taking a vaccine should, should be a, an individual choice. Mm -hmm. We see, we understand the mm -hmm. effect of mandates and we respect the, the, our member countries to make the decision that's actually most appropriate for them. Mm -hmm. Minister, in their countries like France, where overnight the vaccine rate, the vaccine uptake multiplied exponentially because the government announced that if you weren't vaccinated, you weren't going to have access to restaurants, museums, and so on. What's the current thinking here? Well, the, the, there's no change in the in the current thinking, which is obviously very different from France. Um, again, I, I, I agree with Mr. Stein that the governments, individual respective governments, have to make their decisions based on their particular context. Um, we never really contemplated mandates in the strictest form, like France, uh, as an example. We have, however, taken decisions around um, access to certain activities or events, mm -hmm. um, like sporting events, um, if you're vaccinated, um, in terms of our borders, mm -hmm. uh, testing mm -hmm. to enter, as other countries have done. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, we have had a sort of hybrid approach. Mm -hmm. and, and that approach to, for us was important because we do believe that the circumstances of how our society is structured or culture um, may create levels of dislocation that would perhaps outweigh the benefits mm -hmm. that we would seek to achieve. Mm -hmm. And it, it's something that we deliberated a lot over, mm -hmm. but clearly came down on the side of, of the current position. Now, mm -hmm. one could argue that it may have resulted in a low take-up. Um, I'm not so sure, mm -hmm. to be totally frank. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a, so this is a question from Slido about public sector employees um, who have received the jab and is there any data? This survey did not disaggregate for what, what sector people were in, 
but we are aware as a minister and Mr. Stein would be that there has been a disturbingly low take up, particularly by public sector healthcare workers. And when we shared the study with our stakeholders, that came up also as a very significant problem. What's the thoughts on, you know, is this something that you need to be researching more? Have you figured out how you're going to address this in, in the Jamaican context? And then I asked you, Mr. Stein, to just talk about that from a more regional perspective. Well, you know, what's interesting about the, the, the data around public health workers mm -hmm. and take up is that um, traditionally health workers have had very low take up of of, of vaccines. I mean, each year with the flu vaccine, no matter how you encourage it, the take up is generally very low, maybe in the 30% mm -hmm. or so. In fact, we waste a lot of the we, uh, mm -hmm. flu vaccine. That's something we make a headline over. Um, in this case, uh, the take up has been higher than usual. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you speak to the respective associations like the NAJ, Nurse Association of Jamaica, they tell you that they're close to 70 or so percent. Our impression based on what we have seen is that the take up is somewhere in the region of 50 to 60 percent mm -hmm. of healthcare workers, which still leaves a large block mm -hmm. that have not taken the vaccines. Uh, the, the, we, we have tried a number of things. I mean, we have tried to address the risk factor through small groups, through encouragement, using the very same leaders in the, in the mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. um, it, had some impact, but not the level of impact that we would like. Um, and there is a general view that if you are a healthcare worker, you know the precautions to take. And so you will mask up, you will sanitize, you will do what. And there's also a fair degree of distrust, unfortunately, with the vaccine itself, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there is a view that it's not as tried, tested, and proven, mm -hmm. which we have tried to deal with. And so we, we have had to face those challenges, but we continue to encourage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How is PAHO treating with this very serious issue in the, in the vaccine rollout? Yeah, for us, it's actually, there's a number of disturbing aspects of this. Mm -hmm. Let us recognize that, as an example, nurses, uh, they are a, a group that is a sub- group of the population as a whole. We would like them to have a positive approach towards vaccination. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why it's so important for us to have them have that uh, positive approach and uh, take actions in getting the jab is because we know the trust factor that people are turning to these people mm -hmm. to, to make their decisions. Mm -hmm. However, we recognize, as the ministers mentioned, that there's trends that we see in this respect. Mm -hmm. And the trends that we see with the uh, public health employees, uh, which are beyond nurses, not just nurses, mm -hmm. uh, and it's important to make that distinguishing between the, the types of professions that we're talking about. But there's long-term trends about immunization overall. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's another issue that is really concerning for us. Mm -hmm. Because while we're talking about COVID today, mm -hmm. we should be keeping our eye on other issues. Mm -hmm. We need to be talking about measles rates. Mm -hmm. uh, in a very disturbing situation, we have to recognize that our coverage on polio, which has been eradicated for a long time in the Americas, the coverage rates for polio is significantly lower than we want it to be. Mm -hmm. And these are all issues that, uh, they, they're, they're dots that are connected. Mm -hmm. And so while we talk about public policy and we talk about the impact on certain sectors, these are all indica troubling indicators that we can't let our guard down. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Etienne, the regional director for, for WHO and PAHO's director, her press conference earlier this week, that was the theme, was we can't let our guard down now. There's too many things that are uncertain about the future. And we can't let our guard down on COVID, mm -hmm. and we have to revisit our guard on other routine immunizations mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Can, I, can I just say that, um, you know, I'm, I'm probably not, as a member of the governing body for public health, mm -hmm. uh, WHO. Uh, one of the lessons coming out of this experience over the last two years is the extent to which we have to mount a much more assertive uh, challenge to the alternative view mm -hmm. around immunization or vaccinations mm -hmm. generally. Mm -hmm. um, I believe the world has lost ground mm -hmm. 
there was a time when 99% of a population got their vaccines as a routine. Mm -hmm. In some instances, we mandated, mm -hmm. obviously, by law going into the school system. But there is an, 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 a, a sort of nibbling away of that belief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not a country problem. Mm -hmm. I think it's an indication that we have a much bigger problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps this generation has forgotten mm -hmm. the benefits of vaccination mm -hmm. and immunization mm -hmm. against traditional mm -hmm. threats. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to start being more deliberate. And I, I personally, as a Minister of Health, in the halls of the region and the hemisphere and the world, intend to voice my own opinion around that, because I do believe that that is one of the big lessons out coming out of the COVID experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Many. Please. Um, spot on. I mean, <laughs> what we are hearing from our ministers of health is this issue that we need to revisit how we are approaching the one of the foundations of public health around vaccination. Mm -hmm. We know it's one of the most cost effective interventions that there is to address uh, disease. Uh, and so we hear this consistently from the ministers of health, your colleagues in the Caribbean, we hear it through the region. And I think that what we are also recognizing or trying to internalize is that where we have been successful before was success in a particular time, mm -hmm. in a particular context. Mm -hmm. We are in a different time, a different context. The, the access to information and the information pandemic, right? The overload of information mm -hmm. requires us to revisit how we are adjusting our strategies to make sure we have the similar outcomes that we've had in the past. The Americas is the leader, has historically been the leader in vaccination. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we need to look at this and own it ourselves mm -hmm. and be the leaders in the future to say, how are we going to show the rest of the world how to address this challenge, this new challenge to the public health? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is my last question before we wrap up, and it's a two-part question. These are from Slido. So, Ian, for you first, and then you can follow up, a Minister. Uh, what do you guys <laughs> think about the data released by Pfizer, about the mountain of side effects that are associated with the vaccine? And then, Minister, I'd like you to follow up with your thoughts on the feasibility of an insurance uh, program to cover side effects and complications from the vaccine? I, I often think about these things uh, not as a, a public health person, but as Ian Stein. Mm -hmm. uh, I have taken many uh, decisions in my life that are risk-based. Mm -hmm. And typically speaking, I'm probably uh, more accepting risk of many other persons. Mm -hmm. However, for me, when I look at vaccination and I consider the risk versus the reward, it's clear to me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for me, I am very pro-vaccination. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I often reflect on which ones I have not had, not the ones I have had. Mm -hmm. And so when I hear the challenges and the new information that we see coming from manufacturers, I have to reflect, does it change my mind? And the answer is no, because we still see that the adverse issues that have come out uh, at, with new information is still a small percentage. We are talking about billions of doses mm -hmm. of the range of different vaccines that have been applied around the world. Mm -hmm. And the, the challenges that we're seeing are still a very, very, very small number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting that the, the, the side effects are highlighted and they're highlighted more out of a requirement mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to this type of product drugs the laws require every uh, side effect to be highlighted it doesn't require that level of scrutiny for a can of beans mm -hmm. which comes with its own potential side effects mm -hmm. so for the the sort of uh, critical analytical perspective the truth is it boils down to the risk that every aspect of life represents mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the reward that a decision around a particular aspect of life provides mm -hmm. and there is no doubt that once vaccines go through the traditional process of 
uh, experimentation, you know, um, clinical trials, expert review, which is what we have done in Jamaica. We did not take vaccines that were not WHO approved, mm -hmm. emergency approvals, but approvals nevertheless. Mm -hmm. We are comfortable that historically that process works mm -hmm. and the good is far greater than the side effects. Mm -hmm. So the answer to that question is that while I acknowledge all of that, um, I we stick with the science mm -hmm. and use the science to achieve the greater good. Mm -hmm. And I think we're on good grounds when we do that. Now, as it relates to a, an insurance arrangement, you know, if we could, in a sense, the government does have one. Mm -hmm. We have free health care. Mm -hmm. So we provide support to anyone who is ill mm -hmm. in our health institutions. And uh, that has to be borne mm -hmm. uh, in terms of a cost. Um, the kind of compensation that would involve maybe a payout beyond the medical response is something that uh, was not thought of during this period. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it would involve many actors mm -hmm. and in an emergency mm -hmm. you tend to prioritize your response mm -hmm. uh, i don't think we had enough time during that period mm -hmm. to conceptualize this kind of quote-unquote insurance arrangement mm -hmm. but we did assure the public and mm -hmm. continue to assure the public that any adverse effect or impact would be treated with as a matter of priority and mm -hmm. it's actually a part of the vaccine protocol mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we kind of de facto have that in a way. In a sense, okay. yes. So our last question, uh, we have three minutes and we want to wrap up on time. And I'll ask Ian to answer first and then give you, Minister, the last word. There's a sense in Jamaica now that we've kind of already gone back to normal. The traffic is, is back to, I think it's worse than it was before the pandemic. How are we going to convince Jamaicans that vaccines are still relevant what are, what what do we what do Jamaicans not know that they ought to know why we still need to continue to push to for people to take vaccines if, if I reflect on this for me the as we say the proof is in the pudding the if we look around the world and the countries that have managed to move forward and to return to some sense of I don't know if the word normalcy is the right word, mm -hmm. some kind of next phase. Mm -hmm. Those are the countries that have the highest vaccination rates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when we have the opportunity to see what is taking place in other countries, and we see the opportunity lost uh, here, uh, it, it's, uh, it's worth noting. Uh, what are we missing here? Uh, the, the central question that you're asking. For me, the issue is the ongoing risk. Mm -hmm. Variants are what viruses do. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for, for me, I consider that the ongoing risk of a potential variant that is as transmissible as others with other further serious repercussions is one that we have to reinforce is a real risk. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I do believe that the, 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 the challenge ahead as it relates to vaccine hesitancy or overcoming that is, is that much greater with the threat being perceived, real or perception uh, to be less. And particularly among the cohorts that are low, have lowest, the lowest take of the younger people. So I think it's a, it's a big task. I think our approach has to be to continue to provide and make it easier for access as your study have suggested. So, we're now discussing access through more private physicians and, and basically compensating them for providing the vaccines. Um, the fixed sites, so people who go to the health centers as a routine would have the access. Um, and beyond that, I think it's important for us to continue to track the virus itself and how it is evolving, whether as less of a threat or more of a threat, whether through a variant strain or otherwise, and provide, in a sense, the impetus, the motivation, based on a heightened alertness and risk for persons to take up. I think risk ultimately, or the perception of personal risk, mm -hmm. is going to be the key driver. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily access, mm -hmm because if people don't perceive it is as necessary, but 
particularly in our culture where small things like uh, the sight of a needle mm -hmm. is a scary prospect, it is going to make it difficult. So we are going to have to keep the message, push the influence, monitor the threat, and provide the information. And I think hopefully that will lead to further take up. Um, but it's a tall order. That's mm -hmm. the reality. Okay. Thank you both. Uh, the last thing we're going to ask you, our viewers, thank you for the great questions that you put, is to answer our second poll on the findings of the study. I'm going to turn back over to Dominique, who's going to take us out. Thank you, Diana. And thank you also for guiding this rather enlightening conversation this evening. We would also like to extend thanks to our panelists, Dr. Christopher Tufton and Mr. Ian Stein, for joining and engaging in this evening's discussion. We'd also like to say thank you to our corporate sponsors and thank you to our audience for tuning in. We have one final request of our audience and it is to go back to Slido and rate this evening's event. Be sure to look out for the launch of our upcoming reports on financing tertiary education next month. Tonight's report is available on our website at caprecaribbean.org. Once again, Thank you for joining us. Have a good night.